You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. We ask that you would um, speak through Eric and that you would touch the lives of those who are in the room and give them exactly the words that they need to hear this morning. Father, we praise you and thank you for being um, present and being caring and Lord, being gracious, and Lord, we ask that um, you would speak and that you would move. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Friends, you may be seated at this time. Um, If you're visiting with us, we're about to dismiss a thing called Shakeout. It's for three years old through fifth grade. They lead to a certain song. We would love to host your kids. If you're visiting, you can check them in back there at Shakeout TV. They'll lead the way to this tune. Shakeout. Shake out. Shake out. Shake out. Deep water, where you look down and you see the light trying to punch its way through refracting, stretching, and reaching until darkness and the deep take over, and you get this quiet, unsettled fear of what is beyond where the light can reach. The water to the people of the ancient world was always a symbol of chaos, the unknown and uncontrollable power, and it was feared. They lived with this balance between needing water to sustain life, and water being the place where the great deep waits in the darkness, a place where the great creatures of the deep roam, and yet in the deep, God has redeemed. Over the chaotic waters, God's Spirit has hovered, and within the waters, God has worked. There's a theme in Scripture that I want to go into with you. A place where there is life, chaos, cleansing, depth, fear, and sustenance, which all matter to God. Because what God loves, He puts into the water. We start a series today called The Water. We don't normally, we've done a lot of topical, um, not topical, book by book preaching. We've gone through Ephesians, we went through the story of Joseph this last summer. We've stayed really rooted in, in a single narrative for uh, quite a while, just over a, almost a year now. And um, we wanted to break with that and do a kind of a look, uh, a broad brush look at the idea of water within Scripture. It's really fascinating what, what goes on when you look at water. And we're going to do that really up till the beginning of the Christmas season. And, and we're going to take a look at it. Today we begin um, uh, this little section called Into the Water. We uh, Theologically, we know this, that when, when we say the, theology, what we know to be true of God is this, that what God loves, he puts into the water. But what does that mean for us? How do we unpack that and how do we understand? Here's, here's the reality. We're going to do it by looking at a series of different characters in Scripture. And this character today that starts the series, we actually have a connection to through the Joseph series. We're talking about Moses today, and one of the most well-known figures in all religious history, especially in Christian and Jewish history. And when we look at that, what we want to do is understand and remember who Joseph was, the person who brought them to Egypt. Remember, Joseph, this brother who was betrayed, assaulted, and sold into slavery by his brothers, the sons of Jacob, Jacob being renamed by God, Israel. So when we talk about the children of Israel, they're the children of Jacob, and Joseph goes to Egypt, sold as a slave, works his way up in Potiphar's house. Then Potiphar's wife falsely accuses him of sexual assault. Potiphar throws him in jail where Joseph commences to uh, just kind of sit in jail and waste away for the next number of years until Pharaoh, king of Egypt, has a dream. And the only person who has the understanding of that dream is Joseph. It's a dream where there'll be seven years of um, great abundance and harvest followed by seven years of famine. And God gives Joseph wisdom and understanding to create a system where they store the grain and the people of Egypt and surrounding nations are saved. They're saved. The people of God, the Hebrew family, the people of Israel are dearly loved by the Egyptians because of Joseph. He was the second in control of the country. But 320 years after Joseph, the Egyptian people have forgotten a little bit. Uh, Exodus says this, then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. That's the scripture that jumps out at us. 
and we understand that this new Pharaoh has no connection to um, Joseph or the people of Israel other than the sense of fear and dread because the Israel people or the Jewish people had become very numerous. There were so many of them. They were, um, well, they were having six daughters at a time, right? They were really, they were fruitful and multiplying and there was a lot of them. And the Egyptian leaders said, what if we go to war with a foreign power and these Hebrews decide to turn and fight against us? And they began to enact a series of laws and decrees over the Hebrew people. And they drove them and worked them harshly. But what we find is there's this new sentiment that says there can't be so many of them. So they enact the first really genocide against the Jewish people in the history of the world. The Pharaoh puts out a command to kill every baby boy born to a Hebrew mother by throwing them into the water, into the Nile. When we talk about the Nile, we need to understand the breadth and the depth of this body of water. It is not some meandering stream across the north of Egypt. It is a massive river. You can put ships on it. The most deadly part of it, you would think, would be the abundant number of crocodiles living in the Nile and its basin, but it's not. It's the hippos. Like, think of it. There's this massive body of water with all kinds of shipping and traffic and trade, and they are commanded to throw their babies into the water. Into the water. The people of God are being told to cast their sons into. We are going to read from Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, and it says this. Now, a man who was of the tribe of Levi, remember Levi was one of the sons of, ja- of Jacob, Israel, so uh, a Levite who's also the priestly order. Um, now, a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, She got a papyrus basket for him. She coated it with tar and with pitch. Then she placed the child into it and set it into the reeds, into the water along the bank of the Nile. His sister, Miriam, stood at a distance to see what would happen to her little little brother who's about three months old floating on the Nile. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and her attendants were walking with her among the reeds. On the riverbank, she saw the basket among the reeds, sent her female slave to get it, and they opened it and saw the baby, and he was crying. She felt sorry for the little boy. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she says. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, I love this, I love this. How courageous do you have to be as a Hebrew slave to approach Pharaoh's daughter about this little Boy, and she says, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? I think that's an awesome, brave question. I love the answer. Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got Moses' mom. And this is what Pharaoh's daughter said to her. Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. To which every mother's like, that's right. We deserve pay, right? How much work are little babies? But she says, take this baby and I will pay you if you will nurse him for me. So the woman took her son, the baby, home. And when the child grew older, she took him, took him back to Pharaoh's daughter and he, Moses, became her son. She named him Moses saying, I drew him out of the water. That's what his name means. When we talk about what God puts into the water, we need to understand there is this kind of, well, there's this depth of pain and reality in this story that we can't sanitize. We don't like to get uncomfortable in our faith sometimes. We like to make sure scripture is clean and scrubbed up so it feels good. But can you imagine with me what it was like? Have you ever had a moment in your life where you're like, this isn't how it's supposed to be? Have you ever had that moment? I mean, there's lighthearted things, like smaller things. I remember a couple years ago, uh, Erica and I and the kids went to Colorado to spend Thanksgiving at my mom's house. We hadn't been there for Thanksgiving in a number of years. Um, The day before, I don't know, it was like 10, 30, 11 at night. You hear that sound as a parent. You know this sound well. When they go, Mom, and you're like, oh, oh, something's like something's about to come flying forth. And he yacked, Ethan yacked on the floor. So we clean it up. We get him kind of laid back down. And he just, I mean, that kid commenced a cleansing. 
right? I think he, he puked 10 plus times. It was horrible. And it was Wednesday night, the night before Thanksgiving. Now, Ethan loves family get-togethers and like the Thanksgiving meal. He loves it. And it was not, it just felt so wrong to be sitting the next day at that dinner table where we're all eating, wondering who's going to catch the plague next. Did anybody ever do that? So you're eating and it's great food, but you're like, I'll just have water. Because you've seen it come shooting out of them, and you don't want to play that game. So everybody's like, it's cool. I don't need pie. That's the only time I've ever said that. (laughs) Only time. Because I've seen my son get sick, but not only that, to have to get up from the the Thanksgiving table that we hadn't been around with my mom for years and have to leave and check because our little guy was sick. You're like, it's not how it was supposed to be. That's not how we planned it. Anybody else have moments like that? Yeah, you have moments like that all the time where life just in spectacular fashion disappoints. But then there's other things. There's the bigger moments where you're like, it's not supposed to be like that. When you're standing at a wedding and you're, you're supposed to be celebrating, but you're looking at one another as a groom and a bride, knowing that there's a relative who maybe should have been there, but they died suddenly or unexpectedly, and you're going, this, it, shouldn't feel, it shouldn't have heartache with this day. It should be our wedding. It should be a celebration, but we're still grieving the loss of someone. When you see an announcement for babies on the screen, and you've sat in the infertility clinics and the different places, and you thought, this isn't the way it was supposed to be. My husband and I, my wife and I, we were going to have a house full of kids and God, why aren't you answering? And we find ourselves saying again and again, this isn't how it's supposed to be. The waters. We talk about the waters. See, I think this is similar to how Moses' mom felt. Imagine with me what it was like when she started showing and she started getting around tummy and then Moses started punching around in there, being a baby inside his mom like they do. And one day, oh, the pains come. And the question is, what kind of baby are we going to have? It's going to be a boy or is it going to be a girl? And the quiet prayers between mom and dad of God, please let it be a little girl. Please let it be a little girl that she will grow and live a full life. Please, not a little boy. And the contractions continue, and the baby is born, only to come out, have its cord cut, and they present to Jochebed, Moses' mom, here's your son. And she knows that there's a death sentence over his head, and what should be joyful and life-giving and so wonderful is this darkness that you feel like, oh, why? It isn't supposed to be this way. You'd be gripped with fear. You'd be terrified for what could happen. You'd be terrified that this child won't make it past about three months, because we all know this. In the first three months of life, babies are awesome. They poop, which isn't awesome. They eat, they sleep, and they repeat that process every day, 50 times a day, it feels like. Around the clock, or so I've heard. (laughs) um, Uh, It's a terrible joke. It's not especially not funny to Erica. Um, But, uh, you know, they do this around the clock again and again till about three months. And then one day they look at you and go, ah. And you're like, ooh, if you're Moses' mom, you're like, no, we're not shouting in this life. We're indoor voice people, right? What happens at three months when he starts cooing and giggling and squeaking? Have you ever found when the kid finds that little high-pitched note in their voice box? And like, hey, and you're like, oh, my word, like dogs are just covering theirs so loud. This is Moses' mom going, I can't keep him quiet anymore. He's three months old. He's beyond this little quiet phase of just growing and, and getting bigger and getting changed and cleaned up and put back to bed. He's now moving and active and alive in a world that says he must die. All the growth points are actually grief points, and they go, why? It brings more fear and more worry. Nothing is turning out right for Jochebed and her husband, and especially for little Moses. It should be a time to celebrate, but now their lives feel like they're falling apart. And the hiding him is no longer an option. So she does the unthinkable and heads to to wherever the little pantry to grab a basket and a can of tar and begins pitching a basket to make it waterproof. Can you imagine what it was like to put a pad in there because you don't want his head to get all on the scratchy papyrus? Can you imagine what it was like when she kind of put him in there and put the top on and said goodbye to her baby, not knowing what God was going to do and took him down to the water and floated him into the reeds where there are crocodiles, where there are hippos, 
where there are Egyptians who want to kill them. Can you imagine that moment? Have you imagined that moment? See, for you and I, we say this isn't how it was supposed to be. This isn't what it was supposed to be like. God, what's going on? But I think quite often when we look at Scripture, we could say this. Or is our circumstance exactly what God had planned? And you think, wow, that is a cruel thought. Not if he's taking care of our souls for eternity and has a plan to bring about new life through Christ in us. So we look at the life of Moses and we can see that God had a plan. We can trust that God had a plan in this. How could being, like, how could putting her baby into that water with the hippos and the, and the different creatures and the Egyptians all around, how could that be what God planned? Wouldn't you ask the same question? How can this be your plan? God, God, you told us as your people, be fruitful, multiply. We did that, and now our sons are in the river. God, what's going on? God, why? But here's the reality of people who are steeped, transformed in a relationship with God. Jochebed, Moses' mom, looked to God. She looked for God. When everything seemed wrong, she looked for the one thing she knew to be right. And that's got to strike a chord with you and I. When everything goes away, do we look for the thing that is right? When everything goes wrong, do we know what's right? Do we know who's right? Do we hold on to what matters? We don't know how Jochebed got the idea to make a little boat for her son. We don't know how she thought to, to make this little boat and float it out into the reeds with a breath of a prayer, but we make it sound so nice. Can you imagine with me the chaos of a mother's soul floating her child into the river that will eat him? Can you imagine the gut-wrenching sobs, the cries of why, the collapsing on the riverbank thinking, my God, what have I just done? Can you imagine? Can you imagine the little sister Miriam watching her mom and then sneaking into the reeds where she's kind of masked by the reeds and walking along watching her bro brother float through the Nile and then catching her breath as Pharaoh's attendant catches him and thinks, oh no, that's about the worst thing. I would have taken a crocodile over them. They're the ones who made the law. But then can you imagine how her heart skipped a beat can you imagine when she saw her opportunity, mustered up her sisterly strength and walked out and said, you want me to find somebody to take care of that baby for you? See, what we understand is she was going to put her baby into the Nile, Jochebed was, but God was in the waters. God had a plan. And sometimes we as Christians desire this luxurious, easy life, but I just don't see it way out that way in Scripture. Our lives are full of heartache. There is trial, there is pain, and there is things that we wish didn't happen. The difference between faith and not faith is hope within it. Does God still redeem out of the brokenness of this life? Does God still work? And I would say yes. Because Jochebed's life tells us that when we do something that seems unthinkably painful and we put into the chaotic waters of life something we love dearly, God still has a plan. God still has a plan for us. You know, I think um, it's amazing to me when she put her son into the river, all her dreams of him must have washed away. But it was at that moment that God's plan for him fully came alive. How many things are we willing to let go into the crazy chaos of this life in order for God to fully resurrect it? If you've ever faced a terrible diagnosis and you sit with your hands open and say, okay, God, I don't know what's going on, but I will hold on to you only. I will trust you only. This is no longer my life. Let your will be done. It gets really real in that moment. It quits being this ethereal concept and it starts becoming something where we realize that what God loves, he puts into the water. And the waters of this life are chaotic. They're painful. We could rename the Nile and call it loss, cancer, infertility, murder, Rape, violence, car accidents. Insert the adjective that most fits the chaos of the waters for you. I have my own chaos. 
We have our own heartaches. We know this to be true, that life churns often like the Nile against us. But I will say this, in those circumstances, God, God's plan does not fail. God's hand doesn't cease to guide. And God's redemption will shine more, more profoundly out of our darkness and brokenness than it ever will out of our success and luxury. We have to be people who understand that when she put Moses into the river, God's plan fully kicked into gear. And what happens? Eventually we know that about 80 years later, Moses will return and he will lead the people of God out of slavery that they've been in for 400 years into a new identity as people tethered by God's name. How legit is it that we can say the same thing about us? That in our brokenness, we fell on our knees before Christ and he gave us his name and he walked us through the waters of chaos and he didn't absolve us from the pains of this life, but he did redeem them. We can live in the redemption, in the power of that redemption. So the question for you and I is this, are we willing to name the waters? Are we willing to name the waters, the chaos, the heartache, and the brokenness, or are we just gonna put on the nice Christian veneer that helps us sit up straight, do everything we should, and think that we're paying dues to a God who will make sure harm doesn't hit us? That's not how it works. We have to name the waters. I've tried to name some for you, but I want you to think about it with me. What is going on in your life that makes you throw your hands up and say, this isn't the way it was supposed to be. Just help me out. Anybody else say that recently about a certain situation? You throw your hands up and you're like, God, this isn't the way it was supposed to be. This wasn't supposed to happen to my retirement, to my, to my best friend, to my brother, my sister, my spouse, my children. This isn't the way it was supposed to be. What for you has caused that sentence to fall out of your mouth? God, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. What waters seem to threaten what you love most? Name them. It's okay to name them. I encourage you, whether you go home alone from here or with a family, go home and name the waters. Name the waters that seek to chaotically and overpoweringly swamp your life and ruin your hope for the future. And then remember the name that still calms the storms. Remember the name that says quiet to the wind and the waves, be still. We need to be people who understand we are not exempt from the harm of this life. We are called to faith within the waters because what God loves, he puts in the water. He will form in you and I a character that more fully reflects Christ, but something in us has to die. And generally it's in the waters that that happens, the chaos of this life. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. What does that mean? Something of him had to die. Something of him had to die. So let's ask another question. What if, what if God knows better? What if God sees beyond what we can see? And what if God loves us more than we could ever fathom? More than we could ever fathom. What if God still on the throne. How about we say it this way? Praise God that he's still on the throne because we live in this tension that says we know that God knows better. We just don't understand his ways. But how thankful are you that this three pound egg between my ears isn't the be all end all know all. We would be in a hurt locker if that was true. Thank God that he is bigger. Thank God that we can't conceive of the depth and the vastness of his plan and the way he will weave together the littlest details for the glory of God in Christ Jesus and his church. Amen? Live with me in the tension that it's okay not to be okay. It's just not okay to stay there. We grab onto the one thing, the rock of our salvation that the waters break against. We grab onto Jesus Christ and we unapologetically hold fast to the one who says, what if the waters are threatening? What if they are? We hold fast to the one who says, if the waters are threatening you, I will use you, those waters to draw you close to myself. And your life like Moses will be for the redemption of many. But first, we gotta go into the waters 
And we gotta admit, in this world, you will have trouble, but don't forget the second part of that. Take heart. Our Lord, our Savior, the author, the perfecter of our faith said this, I have overcome the world. We might not see on this side of heaven the answers to the what ifs and the whys, but we will see the answer to the peace of Christ speaking to the storms we face. If we will be people who trust in the character of a God who loves us. So what if? What if God knows better? Will you cling to that with me? Will you hold me up when I need a what if? Can you let us hold you up when you need a what if? Can we be the church without the veneer and just kind of be an ugly concrete wall and just stand up and be like, oh, it's not real pretty, but we are held up and buoyed in the hope of Christ over and against the circumstances or the waters of this life. Name your waters and then ask what if. There's a story, uh, a song by Laura Story called Blessings, and I love the way it says this. What if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through the tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? Just help me out so people don't feel alone. Anybody here have a sleepless night lately because there's a thousand terrors pulling at you? Yeah, they're lame. They're the worst. You wake up exhausted having to face the same grind, but this time exhausted. Goes on to say, what if my greatest disappointments or the aching of this life is the revealing of a greater thirst that this world won't satisfy? What if the trials of this life, the rain, the storms, the hardest nights are your mercies in disguise? There is a longing that lives in you and it comes from the soul level. C.S. Lewis said it this way. I have a need, a desire in me that the world cannot meet, which means only one thing. I was meant for a different world. Oh, right? Preach all day with that, Lewis. All day. I wasn't meant for this life, so I'm not gonna hold on to it. Crazy. I'm gonna hold on to the purposes of God within this life. The purposes of God within this life. What if the trials of this life, the rain, the storms, the hardest nights are the mercies of God in disguise. May it be true for you as it's true for me because I know this, we will face hardships. It's who do we turn to amid them. Lord Jesus Christ, we, your church, gather around this word and we just admit that our lives are broken beyond the facade we wear. And there is waters all around us. It has names and we've named many of them, but not nearly enough. So today, God, we as a church confess that from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And from day to day, you continue to reign sovereign over this world. You, God, have surrendered none of your authority over our lives. And we trust that if you've put us into the waters, that you, God, are a God who yet redeems. And we cry, at your good pleasure, when your purpose is fulfilled, will you draw us out of those waters and let us experience the sound of your voice. Peace, be still. In the name of Jesus, amen. Friends, please stand and sing. This song is a confession of faith. Imagine with me for just a minute what it was like that day when Moses' mom put that little boy into the waters. And then I want you to remember that we have a God in heaven who said, call me dad. And every day, people created in his image are put into the waters and mauled by this culture. And we sit on the truth. But I wanna tell you some good news today. Today, Foundry West is out in the reeds, looking around, knocking on doors. There's about 60 of them out there, out telling people, hey, Hey, we know God. We know Jesus. You want to come? You want to be part of it? See, this was never just for us. So please take no comfort if you plan to just sit on this. We are both equal parts, Moses and Miriam, in this story. We are called to know that the waters of this life will churn and rage against us. But we are also called to sneak through the reeds and find God moments where people who are ready to meet Jesus meet him through our witness. Don't feel free 
to sit in cowardice and not want to make people uncomfortable. Feel bound to the brave question of a little girl. Do you want me to go find someone who can take care of him? And I want you to go from this place with equal measures of knowing, yeah, there's probably hurt and heartache in your life. But also, there's a great calling in your life, a purpose, a spirit-filled reason for you to take your next breath and breathe it out in motion for the one who died to redeem you. You, the church of Jesus Christ, is the single means by which God intends to fight the chaos of this world. As you go about living faithfully, even in your own waters, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, my friends, it is time for the church to leave the building as the band plays you out. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.